you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show. Dot com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. There you go. The Iron Lady sings that that makes it bloody official. Welcome to the big show, as always. Bring the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Tell them to join us at uh, Goodreads.com, for says Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, for says Chris Voss. Chris Voss won the TikTok and all those crazy places on the internet if we can ever get our soundboard working right here this morning. Anyway, we certainly appreciate you guys being here. We have an amazing author. As always, we only allow amazing authors on the show. We vet them. They have to do like, you know that thing some people say, it's a special test where you do the cow TV moo thing i don't know you may have heard it in politics but i'm not going to reference it yeah we make them do that test so they have to identify like animals and i don't know add two plus two and then we allow them on the show he is the author of the latest book i made him sound really like i don't know he's just barely phoning it in on the on the iq level but i I assure you this gentleman has an ioq of at least 300 he's the author of the newest book the mighty moo the uss cow pens and her epic World War II journey from jinx ship to the Navy's first carrier into Tokyo Bay. Comes out June 11th, 2024. Nathan Canestro, let me get that right. Nathan Canestaro is on the show with us today. Did I get that right, Nathan? You got it. And thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming. We certainly appreciate you. And uh, now be quiet while I read your bio. I'm just kidding. So Nathan (laughs) is a professional intelligence officer whose research, he's just so excited to be here. I can't, he can't help it. Whose research on his grandfather's service in World War II led to a decade long uh, effort to uncover the story of the USS Cowpens and its crew. Currently on assignment uh, to the National Intelligence Council, he has uh, 25 years experience writing about military operations for policymakers in the U.S. government. He has graduate degrees from the University of Tennessee, Georgetown, and Yale, and lives outside of Washington, D.C. See, I told you this guy's gosh, gosh darn smart. Welcome to the show, Nathan. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank there you very you much for having me. I've got you rolling. All right, so give us your dot coms. Where can people find you on the on the webs? Is it the mighty moo.com? Right. No, the, the other website is <laughs> NathanCanistero.com. I'm okay. on Twitter, this all one word, Nathan Canistero. But if you get on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Target or Walmart, any of the big booksellers, and just search The Mighty Moo, you'll, you'll find the book. I think you should buy the, the domain Moo.com. I think that'd be funny. <laughs> Might be expensive though. Check and see if somebody's already got that one, but yeah. that's a good point. Yeah, there's probably some milk companies got that. So speaking of milk, let's drink up your latest book. <laughs> what the hell is that about? The Mighty Moo. Give us a thirty thousand overview of what's inside. Sure. So I started researching this book to find out about my grandfather's service in mm. World War II. And he was a tail gunner on a torpedo bomber in the Pacific mm. and served aboard a light aircraft carrier called the USS Cowpens. Now, my grandfather was a lot like you know many men from his generation. He didn't like to talk about the war. It was he saw a lot of action. It was traumatic. Mm-hmm. When he came home, he wanted to put it behind him. But every so often, he kind of hint at things that it that had happened to him. And for a guy like me, you know, I'm interested in World War II history and, mm-hmm. and grew up with Band of Brothers and Saving Private Ryan. That was like catnip. You know that there was a <laughs> grandpa had a story there, and it and he wasn't going to tell it to me. So yeah, after he passed in in 2010, wow. I decided to to go looking into it, see what I could find out on my own. And I, I found this incredible underdog story about about his ship and his mm-hmm. crew. So it was a, a ship that the Navy initially didn't want with a captain that had nearly been scapegoated for the loss of his last command. The, the crew had been in uniform barely longer than the ship had been afloat. The pilots self-trained on the planes they'd fly into battle. And the first few months that she was in service, she had a terrible sort of string of bad luck as jinx. And yet, despite all these you know problems, the ship that nobody expected much from, she earned a distinguished combat record, survived a deadly typhoon, and ended up the only U.S. aircraft carrier in Tokyo Bay to see the Japanese surrender. Wow. Yeah. Was that because there, you know so many of them have been destroyed with Pearl Harbor in the war? 
It actually, it almost ex exactly the opposite. You know, now we know when the Japanese surrendered that they meant it. But at the time, a lot of people didn't trust them. You know, Admiral Halsey thought the, thought the whole thing might be a trap. It's a trap. That, yeah, that they would sort of invite the Americans in, say they're going to surrender, and then, you know, attack them, double-cross them. It was essentially sent in because she was expendable. Admiral Halsey wanted all his big carriers out at sea where they'd be safe. They well, we can, you know, if we lose the captains, it'll be okay. You had to watch those tricky pre-war Japanese. See, I said pre-war Japanese. The, the post-war Japanese are wonderful people. You know, these are guys who lived through Pearl Harbor, so you know, they, were, they were pretty suspicious. Pretty tricky, Japanese the Pearl country. Harbor on us. Yeah. yeah. They pulled that. They pulled that. So, you know, I can see why there was maybe some issues of trust. Yeah. So I'd never heard of the USS Cowpens. When I was a kid, I used to read a lot of books, and I had, I'd buy the models of all the mm -hmm. stuff, and I'd read about Eisenhower and and General MacArthur and all the all the great generals and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, so where does the USS Cowpens? Where does that name come from? Is it just like Old McDonald's Farm or something? Or well, what's going it, on there? At the time, aircraft carriers were named after battles, and mm -hmm. the Battle of the Cowpens was a Revolutionary War era battle <clears throat> in upstate South Carolina, mm -hmm. and it was one of the finest tactical victories of the war, set the stage for Yorktown, but it's kind of obscure. You know, yeah. it's not like Yorktown or Saratoga or, or you know, any of the others. And it, it took this little town, and there is a place called Cowpens, South Carolina, that's named after the battle. They sent President Roosevelt a postcard in 1942 and said, hey, can you name a carrier after our battle? Yeah. And the, the rest is history. Wow. How come it wasn't like, how come it's been kind of obscured or it seems to have been obscured? It, it, it wasn't. The simplest answer is it was not a regular carrier. Oh. You know, when, you, when you think about you know, World War II carriers, you think about the big ones like the Intrepid in New York City or, or mm -hmm. you know, Yorktown or any of the others. But the thing is, you know, the U.S., a lot of people forget how badly things were going for the United States in the first year of the war. We started with six aircraft carriers. Mm -hmm. And by the end of 42, four had been sunk in battle. Oh, wow. So we were running out of flat tops in a hurry. and. Yeah. President Roosevelt, even before the war, was worried that we didn't have enough. So he tried to get the Navy to take some ships that were already under construction, these light cruisers. So they're, you know, they're about 40% of the size of a big carrier mm -hmm. and put a flat, flat top on them. And it, so the flight deck and oh, the Navy, okay. the Navy didn't like this idea. They like their big, expensive platforms and FDR really basically had to force them into it. Wow. They built nine of these little ships and they were just a stopgap measure in between, you know, the ships that they'd lost at the beginning of the war and then the big Essexes that were coming along later. Honestly, if, if they hadn't, if the U.S. hadn't been doing as badly as they had, they probably wouldn't have made them at all. So the wow. fact that they're kind of now overlooked is, is not surprising. So they went from, they had six to be in the war and they went down to, f they lost four. So they were down to yeah, two, two, basically. Yeah. Wow, that's the crazy. The situation was so desperate there for a while that we actually asked the Brits if they could loan us an aircraft carrier for 90 days. <laughs> they, they sent the Invincible into the Pacific, so oh, we wow. put Enterprise into the shipyard to patch up her battle wounds. It was pretty touch and go there yeah. for a while. You know what we weren't out of, though? What's that? Nuclear bombs. <laughs> oh, yeah. A little later in the day, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're a little shy on... Uh, Aircraft carriers, but plenty of nuclear bombs. That's a Hiroshima joke, folks. I think I'm going to get hate mail after that. Anyway, guys, so give us a little bit of your background. Tell us a little bit about your grandfather. You did you were you trying to pry this out of him all these years, and you just couldn't get out of him. You're asking everybody, and then what made you you know get into the business you're in? You're you're obviously writing for the government, and mm -hmm. probably doing secret stuff that you can't tell us about without murdering us in a <laughs> secret prison in Poland or something. <laughs> Hardly, Grandpa. Grandpa was a very introspective guy he, he was not the sort of guy that sort of we would want to draw attention to himself mm -hmm. and he just didn't talk about it he came home he had got married had five kids became a carpenter in upstate new york and you know that was that was his life uh -huh. and he would he would hint about a few things he talked about the typhoon we can get about get into that in a second mm -hmm. and but when oftentimes when he told stories it, they were humorous or funny you know he was mm -hmm. trying to emphasize the light the light parts of the experience but he did see a lot of action and mm -hmm. you know when he passed and the, the navy is very good at its record keeping so there was a huge pile of documents you know once you start looking for it and then i started accumulating letters and diaries and things like that um, which have helped me sort of piece the the, the story together and you know you asked a little bit about my job. You know, being an intelligence officer is like being a historian where you don't know the ending. 
Huh? You know, with with it's say, for instance, like D-Day, you know, a historian will look at D-Day and say they won, they did. Now go back and figure out how it is that they did well. And, you know, in my job, we do the opposite. So with history, it's it's a nice change to sort of be able to know how the story ends and kind of be able to to work back from there. There you go. I So they saw a lot of action in the Pacific there then. Yes. Yeah. I did too in the Pacific. Uh, I saw a lot of action, but it was mostly on my trip to Thailand. Not sure what that means. Anyway, so tell us about this typhoon thing. Yeah, December 1944. Nice transition there, by the way. <laughs> this is sailing, and General MacArthur had just invaded Leyte, one of the islands in the Philippines, and Cowpens and the fleet were sailing there to help him out. And, you know, meteorology isn't, wasn't in the 40s what it is today. You have no satellite imagery. You don't know where the storms are. And they sailed right into the teeth of an enormous typhoon. Mm-hmm. And to get, this is one of the things about the ship, you know, because it was never really intended to be a carrier. It was narrow and tall, had a very high center of gravity. So it was a little, shall we say, tippy in bad weather. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you go sailing into a storm with 70 and 90 foot waves and winds of 100 to 120 knots. The ship is rolling back and forth. There was a, a, a roll meter on the bridge and it went 45 degrees to either side. And apparently the needle was roll over to, to the pin at 45 wow. degrees and bounce and then swing back the other direction and then bounce on that needle. So this went on for hours. You um, want to be in dinner about that time. The captain got on the PA and said, anyone who is not on duty, get into your bunks and tie yourself in. Tie you yourself know, in. People are, you know, walking on the walls. The ship is, is tilting so much and yeah. you know, falling and getting hurt. You know what's uh, really bad is if you're walking on the roof. That, the, that's usually not a good that's sign. Bad. Yeah, that's a whole Poseidon ship. thing right there. That's another movie. It's a different the, book. I, it's didn't they remake that not long ago? <laughs> I think they did, and it was probably awful. You can't remake certain movies. <laughs> nah, no, nah, the original is always better. Yeah. But, the, you know, the edge of the flight deck was dipping into the ocean. That's The flight deck's 70 feet above the water in average average seas, and the, apparently they, on the bridge they could reach out and touch the waves. And then down in the, the magazine, the bombs broke loose. They were rolling across the floor, hundred or uh, 500 and 1,000-pound bombs just sort of bouncing like tennis balls. I mean, just a really, really close call. And elsewhere in the fleet, three capsi- three destroyers capsized and sunk, killed almost 800 guys. Oh, no. So it was, Grandpa never talked about the combat, but he, he did talk about this storm. And he was terrified. And I think almost everybody aboard was. Wow. Yeah, I mean, if it's pitching that far back and forth, I mean, that's, that's just crazy. But as long as you're not walking on the roof, things are fine. You might be walking on the walls, though, right, at that point. <laughs> really. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah, I don't think we're supposed to be this far over, folks. But, uh, yeah, you don't want to be see you don't want to have seasickness issues on on that ride. There no, you go. That's no. that's why I stay on land, folks. I don't I don't do cruises. I, although there were some times in Vegas where I drank enough to where my needle was going all the way over, and I was probably walking on the walls. But patrons you know, are advised not to leave the bar while it is in motion. Yeah, the judge says I can't do that anymore. Anyway, <laughs> what are some other tease outs you want to tease out of the book that people should know to p- get them to pick it up? You know, one of the things I, I like most about researching the, the book is is finding some of these fascinating personalities. And one of them was a guy by the name of Clem Craig. And Clem mm-hmm. was the Cowpens' greatest fighter ace. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he finished the war with 12 and a half aerial kills and two Navy crosses, which is a pretty good record. Mm-hmm. But he was an amazing shot with his of uh, the guns on his fighter aircraft, the F-6 Hellcat. F-6 F Hellcat. Wow. You, gotta, you remember, these things only had 400 rounds for each of their guns. So that's about 30 seconds of fire. And he had one mission where he shoots down four aircraft in one mission and another one where he shoots down five. Wow. So, so he's averaging five to six seconds of shooting to shoot down an enemy fighter. Mm-hmm. That's pretty amazing marksmanship for, you know, in the middle of a dogfight. Yeah, that is uh, pretty good. You're in the air, too. With, you know, yeah, it's not, it's moving like, all around. It's not, like, it's not like you have a static sort of thing. Yeah, he went on to fly another 30 missions in Korea. So a, a oh. really, really remarkable guy. That's and a that, guy you want on your Modern Warfare three team. <laughs> he was Amy. he was a pretty intense customer. He's a very you know kind of stern, devoted to duty sort of guy. But Those guys you know, back then were salty, man. They were salt of the earth people, man. They really were. You know, nowadays, you know, the guy kids are like, oh, I got a hangnail. I can't go on the aircraft carrier. Well, if, if you want to talk endurance, I should tell you about a guy by the name of Bob Price. Uh, mm-hmm. Bob, Bob was the commander of their first fighter squadron, and he was shot down over the Pacific attacking a Japanese convoy in June of 44. And they saw him alive in the water in his raft, and he waved back at them. You know, his, his wingmen were circling overhead, say, I'm okay, I'm fine. And so they came back to rescue him, and they couldn't find him. So mm. they hadn't accounted for his his drift on the currents. They staged two res- rescue missions, never found the guy. 
Wow. And ten, 10 days later, one of, <laughs> one of his buddies on another carrier had this dream that Bob Price was out there in the Pacific floating in his raft for, waiting for someone to pick him up. So he went and he talked to his admiral, a guy by the name of Jocko Clark. And Jocko didn't think he was nuts. He says, well, you know, let's see where, where he might be. So they sat down with a map and calculated the currents and said, well, if he's, if he's still alive, he's probably over here. And it was 100 miles out of their way. So they went, they made a 100-mile detour. Who should they find in his life raft after 11 days? But Bob yeah. Price. What about you assholes to wait 10 days? <laughs> <laughs> Guy lost 30 pounds oh, in, in, right. 11, in 11 days. I think I need to go on that diet. That sounds wow. like... Uh-huh. I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah, this is, and as long as I can, well, I was going to say as long as I can take sunscreen, but I might drink the sunscreen, so that might be bad. Yeah, you don't want to drink that seawater. So there you go. I mean, this sounds like a lot of fun. You're going to bring back a, a ship. I, I swear to God, when I was a kid, I was building like all the all the ships, you know, the model ships, mm-hmm. and then I would read about Eisenhower and, and and the Battle of Midway, and like I was really enthralled with all that stuff. And I build the fighter planes. And what was the other book I read? The one. The one about John F. Kennedy when he was in the war with the PT boats. PT-109, yeah. Yeah, I was just obsessed with the whole, I don't know why, I just loved it. That's kind of what you did, you know, it was us against the USSR back then instead of where we're, like, trying to embrace them now, become them. And it was kind of a different time. (laughs) It it was a different time. Where they used to be our enemies, at least for certain parties. Anyway, the, uh, yeah, so I, I loved this whole thing. And it was such an interesting time because there's a strategy of it all. Yes. You know, and, you know, we really got, you know, destroyed with Pearl Harbor. I mean, it was a, and we were lucky on a few fronts that some things didn't go as bad as they were, but, you know, it could have been worse. But yeah, I mean, we, we really, they did a good number on us, but we came back as Americans. We kicked ass, took names, but, you know, thankfully we never ran out of nuclear bombs. (laughs) Well, it was, it was a long haul. I mean, 41 to 45, it wasn't easy. There were a lot of, a lot of tough battles along the way. Oh, yeah. and, and if you were, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book, you know, is trying to figure out like, you know, my grandfather, he's a 22 year old kid from upstate New York. He's never been anywhere. You know, he's never been outside of his home region. You know, that was pretty common in those days. You don't travel like you do today. Uh-huh. You know, what was it like for him? You know, what mm-hmm. was the ship like, the, the food, the living conditions, you know, needs, you know, he and 1400 of his closest friends are packed into this metal can in the middle of the South Pacific with no air conditioning. It, it, it was it was not a, always a pleasant experience, yeah. you know, and the only recreation at times was, you know, they'd let them off in these little little islands in the middle of nowhere and say, okay, everybody gets two beers and you can go swimming. Yeah. Did they look familiar how were they out there? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think that. You know, one of the one of the missions, you, you make the joke, one of the really? missions they were, they were going on, there's a place called Truck, and it was an, an island that the Japanese had made into one of their fortresses, and there was all mm. these crazy rumors about about this island. And one of them was that Amelia Earhart, she was shot down trying to take intelligence pictures of truck. Of course, not true, Uh but you know, that was, you know, we know a lot lot about the Pacific right now, but at the time, some of these places were just total mysteries. They didn't know what was there, what it was Mm -hmm. like, you know, that's not like you take overhead pictures, aerial pictures, like on, you know, Google, Google earth, like you can today. Yeah. I mean, there what was that. Didn't they find like one or two like Japanese soldiers who, for like thirty years, stayed on those islands, and they thought yeah. they were still fighting the war? It was in Saipan. Yeah, you, <laughs> those some of those guys were coming out of out of caves, and you know, until the nineteen seventies. Yeah, they, they crazy. Were pretty determined adversary. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't. They were. I mean, the Japanese. I mean, that was the reason we had to nuke them. Is they were, they were. They were, you know, these kamikazes. I remember studying the kamikaze missions, reading about the kamikaze fighters. They, those boys were committed over there, and uh, they were they were kidding around. Yeah, but uh, glad we all worked it out and we all learned to get along. At least, you know, on that side of the globe. Technically, Russia's on that side of the globe. So there you go. So uh, give people a final pitch out, final thoughts as we go out to pick up the book. You know, the timing on this is great in that we're coming up on Father's Day and a lot of people have relatives that served in World War II. Something like 60% of, of Americans of you know, military age were in, in, the, in the military in some capacity. So for mm-hmm. you know, folks, if you like World War II history or, or you have a relative who served, I think this is a great tribute for Father's Day or Memorial Day has just passed. And, you know, mm-hmm. these stories are important if you don't, you know, kind of dig into your own family history and, and learn you know, what sort of part, part your family had in the, in the big drama, they get lost. So this was my effort to, you know, give that tribute to my, my granddad. 
There you go. Just right after the Battle of, or Battle of Normandy recognition, eighty years, I think it was, or so many some odd years. Eighty, yeah. June yeah. was a big month. You know, they capture yeah. D Day. You had D Day. You capture Rome, and then the Battle of the, the Marianas Turkey Shoot, all in June forty four. There you go. Back when we used to kick ass and take names, and uh, we were always out of bubble gum. <laughs> There's a reference. So thanks very much for coming on the show. I think this is awesome, man. Thank the you. Mighty Moo. I, I thought I knew of all the different things that were in that theater, but now I just learned something new. And I'm also hungry for milk. So there you go. Uh, this, uh, this show has been brought to you by Milk. The American Dairy sure. Council. It makes some people fart, like me. <laughs> so thank you very Nathan, much, Nathan. Did we get your .com so people can find you on the interwebs? Yeah, at, at Nathan Canistero at, and the service formerly known as Twitter and then NathanCanistero.com <laughs> on the web. And then I'm Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any booksellers, you search The Mighty Moo, you'll find it. There you go. Twitter, formerly Twitter, X.com, coming to a bankruptcy court near you. Thank you very much, Nathan, for uh, coming on the show. Order the book wherever fine books are sold, folks, June 11th, 2024. The Mighty Moo. Moo. I feel like I should have to say the do the sound bite on that. The Mighty Moo. The U.S. cow pens in her epic World War II journey from Jinx ship to the Navy's first carrier into Tokyo Bay. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you next time or else. Thank you. There you go.